Size exclusion chromatography, or gel filtration, is a way that we can separate proteins by size. I'm doing it this morning. I just injected my protein sample into um, this machine called an Acta, and it's going to send it through this column, this chromatography column. Um, that column's for, filled with these little beads um, called resin, and based on the resin has all these little tunnels in it. And the bigger proteins can't fit into those tunnels, so they get to take shortcuts. And the smaller proteins have to go through all those tunnels, so they take longer. And so the proteins will separate based on their size. After they um, go through the column, they're going to go through a UV detector. And once they go through that UV detector, then they come out into this little, like, um, sample well, co fraction collector. And so that's going to collect the, um, the fractions in a deep well plate like this. And then I can look at the UV um, readout on the chromatograph, and when the protein comes out, because proteins absorb UV light, I'll see a peak when the protein comes out, and I'll be able to um, correlate that with where the fraction is. Here's more on how it works. Protein chromatography is kind of an umbrella term for a variety of techniques we use in which we flow um, solutions containing proteins that we want to study through columns filled with little beads called resin. Depending on the protein's properties and the resin's properties, the different proteins will interact differently, and this will make them take longer or shorter to travel through the column, um, so you can do things in either a gravity flow, like we looked at when I did the strep tag affinity, so that's where you're filling um, like plastic or glass columns manually and letting gravity drip them through, or with um, an FPLC, so um, fast performance liquid chromatography um, machine like an ACTA that's actually going to use a system of pumps to pump your um, solutions through co pre-packed columns. So you can use different kinds of resins to separate different based on different properties. So with affinity chromatography, you're actually getting the protein to stick. Um, and based on some specific feature, like a tag, like an affinity tag, like strep tag or his tag, and then you're letting everything else flow through, and then you're using a competitor to push your protein off. You can also use ion exchange chromatography, where you're getting proteins to stick based on their different charges. Um, and so I didn't show you, but I actually did ion exchange chromatography yesterday after I did that affinity chromatography with step I showed you. Now it's time for the final step, the polishing step, size exclusion chromatography, also known as gel filtration, which celebrates, sorry, which separates proteins based on their sizes. The weird thing about size exclusion chromatography is it's kind of counterintuitive in that the bigger things are going to come off or elute faster than the smaller things. Um, so why is this? So, size exclusion chromatography, I like to think of it as kind of the beads being a series of tunnels um, with different clearances, so different heights. Um, so, you've been driving and you've seen tunnels where they have those like clearance limits, um, so big trucks can't go through. It's kind of like that. So, big proteins can't get through some of these tunnels. So, these beads have all these different little tunnels of different sizes, um, and some of them are really narrow, and some of them are bigger. So, most of the proteins can get through the bigger tunnels, but only the little proteins can get through the smaller tunnels. So this means that the bigger proteins don't have to go through those tunnels, so they can go around the tunnels. And this allows them to take shortcuts. So the more tunnels you have to go through, the longer the distance you're going to travel. So even though they're traveling at the same, like, miles per hour type of speed, they're traveling at different, um, it takes them longer to get to their destination because they have different destination lengths. So the smaller the proteins, the smaller proteins have to go through more tunnels, so they're going to come out later. Whereas the bigger proteins don't have to go through as many tunnels, so they're not they're going to come out sooner. And why this is kind of confusing is because it's the opposite of what you would see with SDS page. So SDS page is that technique we looked at before, where you um take proteins and you, a sample of protein and you send it through this, um, this vertical gel, so it's this thin slab of gel, and the bigger things are going to go slower 
and the smaller things are going to go faster. And this is because what's happening in SDS page is that the proteins are, um, you, are unfolded and they're going through this gel mesh. And the bigger proteins are going to get tangled up more, whereas the smaller proteins won't get tangled up as much. So the key thing to remember here is that with SDS page, your proteins are unfolded and they're getting tangled up. With size exclusion, your proteins are folded and they're not getting tangled up. They're just going through different sized um, holes. So that's what the SDS page gel results look like. So what do the um, size exclusion results look like? So basically this is what a typical chromatogram will look like. So you pre-equilibrate the column to fill it with the buffer you want. So the column is all these beads are can hold can hold the buffer. And so when you start out, the beads will be full of the buffer that it was equilibrated in. So the buffer that you, so for by equilibrate, we just mean that you got it all consistently filled with the same thing. So if you have it like stored in water, then you equilibrate with your buffer and now the beads are all filled with your buffer. Um, then the first thing that's going to come out is the void. So this is the aggregate. Um, so anything that was too big to go through any of the tunnels. So this is like misfolded proteins that are going to come out here um, and whatever was already in the column. Um, and so a little bit of this part is probably the, is the void too. Um, so this beginning part, but then the beginner, but then the bigger proteins are going to start to come out. You can see what you want is a nice sharp peak like this. Um, if ideally it would be a little sharper, but um, this isn't too bad. It's um, a nice symmetrical peak will tell you that the protein is likely well folded, um, which is good if you're doing something where you don't have like a functional assay readout. So there's no way you can test that the activity of the protein is intact. If you have a good chromatograph, um, it's a good sign that your protein is folded correctly. Um, and then smaller proteins will come out and this allows you to separate the two. Um, these samples in the chromatograph, so those um, at the bottom, you can see those little mark tick marks. Those represent the different wells in the plate. So then I can go to the plate and collect the corresponding protein fractions. So this is the opposite that you would see with SDS page. So with SDS page, the um, tangled proteins are going to, the bigger proteins get tangled more. So they're going to um, travel less far, whereas the smaller proteins aren't going to get tangled as much, so they're going to travel faster. So if you were to take the size exclusion chromatography results, um, so take the different fractions and run them on the gel, you'd see, um, you could see this. So we talked about how the smaller proteins have to go farther and the bigger proteins don't have to travel as far, so they get to come out sooner. But what if you have a big pro big protein attached to a small protein? So this is kind of like a um, a trailer with a car on top of it. So this now it's going to be bigger, even bigger than the two of them combined. So you'll see this shift. So this allows for something called analytical chromatography. So you can actually see if those protein bind. A key thing to note is that the it's going to be harder to see the shift in the bigger protein but it's going to be a lot easier to track the disappearance or the shift um, in the, sig the disappearance of the signal for the smaller protein. So you can see that the purple peak isn't that different from the blue peak, but it's bigger and this red peak has disappeared. So this gets me to the idea of types of chromatography. Um, so we have preparative size exclusion, which is what I normally do. And the goal is to isolate and keep pure, pure protein. So you're taking an almost pure protein and making it even purer. So it's typically like the last phase of step of a protein purification process. Even if your protein is like pure enough that you don't really care, need to separate things by size, it's also a good way to do buffer exchange. So basically um, when you do, so often you're coming off of affinity chromatography where you have a high concentration of competitor or ion exchange chromatography where you have a high concentration of salt and you want to get rid of those. So one of the ways you can do that is with dialysis, which you put your sample in like a little membrane pouch and then you um, let it kind of sit and spin in a beaker full of a bunch of buffer without that competitor 
and then you replace the liquid and that sort of thing. You let the competitor kind of like flush out. So that's a kind of tedious process. Um, besides exclusion chromatography, you just um, run it through the column. So that can be a good thing. Um, but the other type is analytical slice exclusion. And here your goal is to see if proteins stably bind each other. So you take two pure proteins, mix a bit of each, and see if they travel together, like in that um, car on a trailer example I just showed you. So with um, preparative C um, preparative size exclusion, you're typically running like your entire protein sample, whereas with analytical, you're just doing a little portion. So with the little portion bit is similar to you, what you we see with the SDS page um, in terms of just using a little portion of your sample, except here we're not denaturing our sample. Um, so we're not unfolding it, we're running it as it is, and we're running multiple proteins together to see if they interact. Which with the SDS page, that wouldn't help us because we're unfolding the protein is disrupting any interactions. So these use different types of columns. So there are different um, chrom size exclusion chromatography columns. They come in different lengths, widths, and bead types. And so the longer and the, the thinner the column, the finer the separation. Um, so the resolution. So separation is how well you can resolve or tell apart two different proteins. So can you separate them? So the smaller the tunnels is that smaller tunnels are better for separating smaller proteins, but they're not very good for separating bigger proteins because all the proteins will be too big to go through them. So typically the columns have a range of, um, you can get columns with a range of different bead sides and um, the, t or the tunnel sizes, and it's a, it's a mix of tunnel sizes, but the different, um, different columns that you buy, you can have a like an average tunnel size which will be good for your protein of interest. Actually what are these columns actually made of? Some of the columns are actually made of agarose. So agarose you might remember is that sugar that we use to make those gels for separating DNA in those um, agarose gel electrophoresis labs. So Agarose is the sugar, um, and then it can like jellify um, when you dissolve it and heat it up, and then these chains come kind of coil up and they mesh together to form a gel. In, um, in these columns, like superose columns, they uh, cross-link the agarose, so they add little linker parts that make it stronger. Because the agarose gel, um, it's non-covalent interactions so there's no like electron sharing between them so the chains are kind of tangled up but they're not tied together with cross-linking you're kind of tying together those chains to make it sturdier the type of column that i use today is a superdex column which has a different sugar called dextrose now for some more technical details about what it looks like in practice we do this using the acta so it's this machine that uses a system of pumps to direct proteins um, solu containing solutions and buffers, so pH stabilized salt waters um, through these different tubings, um, through different types of columns. Um, and so with the size exclusion chromatography, we actually do it by, so there are different ways you can get your protein onto the column. So there's like sample pumps, which will suck up your sample and then pump it on. Um, but with size exclusion chromatography, you want to have your sample in the smallest volume possible because unlike affinity chromatography, your protein isn't actually going to get stuck to the column and so that your protein is just going to flow at a different rate depending on its size. This means that your protein is not going to get concentrated as it goes through the column. It's just going to get diluted. So you want to get have it get diluted as little as possible, which means you want to start with the smallest volume as possible. So you start by concentrating your protein. Um, so we do this with these concentration spin concentrators um, that we use the centrifuge, and so these tubes have a membrane, um, and you choose the size exclusion limit to make sure that it's the membrane's holes aren't big enough for your protein to flow through because you want your protein to stay in the little membrane cup part. And then you spin it and spin it and spin it and your protein gets concentrated and then you can inject it onto this column. And so the, that little green tubing, um, those are sample loops. So you can choose a sample loop based on the size of that you inject. 
and you um, so you inject your sample, uh, make it stored in the sample loop until you tell it to go onto the column. But the idea here is that you want as little of volume as possible um, so that your protein doesn't get diluted as it goes through the column. So what happens then is that your protein solution travels through the column um, and then it goes passes through a UV detector. So proteins absorb UV light um, strongly at 280 nanomolar um, thanks to the aromatic rings um, of like tryptophan, um, tyrosine, phenylalanine. Um, and so basically this allows you to monitor when your protein is coming off or what we call eluding from the column. And the UV detector is in between the column and the sample collector. So as it passes through the UV detector and into the sample collector, you can then, um, it'll give you this, this graph called a chromatograph. And that's going to show you the UV um, and the elution time. And then you can cross-reference that to the different places, the different wells of the block, so you know which wells have the protein. Then you can then collect it. So when you look at the chromatograph, the height of the um, peak is going to tell you about how much of the protein is there. And the elution volume um, or elution time, so you can do it either, you can um, graph it either based on time or based on the um, volume. So obviously the faster you flow the column, the, um, that'll affect the time, but the volume will still be the same. Um, and typically the slower, you do slower time will give you a better resolution, but it can also take longer, obviously.